We've got a new merch item available for you. It's our Joe Biden elderly man with a poor memory line. Be sure to pick it up at a t-shirt, you know, mug, whatever you want to get. StuDoesMerch.com. Uh, the promo code is Stu10. You'll save 10%. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash StuDoesAmerica. Uh, like the channel. Uh, subscribe for notifications with a little bell. We appreciate it when you do that. And of course, the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Jason Buttrell is here to tell us about the Blaze Media's new bombshell-filled border documentary. The left is doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on their love for abortion. Yay! It's time to celebrate abortion. But we start by doing the EV fizzle. Now, soon you will be at a wedding of someone you don't like, some environmentalists, and they'll be on the front of the stage. They'll be like, hey, guys, it's time to do the EV fizzle. And you'll want to kill yourself. And that will be an appropriate response at that particular time. Uh, but while that might sound fun at a wedding, it's not fun for the companies that are actually doing this. And it's really kind of been an amazing turnaround. You remember electric vehicles were the thing, the hottest thing you could possibly have. Obviously, Tesla leading the way, but a lot of companies were investing heavily in this, and we've seen it kind of go in the tank quickly. Tesla and EV stocks slide on startling news, but Ford rallies. This is from about a week ago, and we've seen that fall continue to happen. And not only have we seen it with more established companies like Tesla and some of the other uh, companies that are announcing these big pullbacks on their EV programs, we're also seeing all the electric vehicle startups outside of Tesla have massive problems. Batteries, batteries drained, EV startups are struggling to maintain momentum. That's a hell of a way of describing the four charts you see on your screen right now. That is not, <laughs> that's not struggling to maintain momentum. This is cataclysmic, like Enron-like collapses in progress. Lucid is down 95%. Rivian is down 94%. Nikola, of course, down 99%. Polestar just absolutely trashing its competitors, only down 91%. So that's good news for them, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Now, of course, you not only have that side of it, the business part of this not going well, and the market reacting negatively to electric vehicles, but you also have maybe they're not all they're, they're cracked up to be when it comes to the environment. Electric vehicles release more toxic emissions and are worse for the environment than gas-powered cars, according to a new study. Brakes and tires on EVs release 1,850 times more particle pollution compared to modern tailpipes, which have efficient exhaust filters, bringing gas-powered vehicles emissions to new lows. And, of course, you see all this happening the negative market reaction, the negative news on the environmental impacts. And of course, you know that the Biden administration is going to back off of all of their promises when it comes to. No, oh, actually, no. Janet Yellen touts electric vehicle boom. As automakers themselves tone down the hype. Yellen touted Biden's EV actions in Kentucky at a new $49 million EV battery factory built by Advanced Nano Products, a battery supplier that will receive tax credits, of course, from Biden's Inflation Reduction Act for the new clean energy facility. It's part of a boom of EV-related investments in Kentucky, Yellen said. The Biden administration policies and federal funds are fueling private sector investments. We'll get into how, these, how this boom is occurring, quote unquote, in just a couple of minutes. But the momentum drop is real, and uh, there is no clearer piece of evidence in to, than in today's New York Times. The, kind of their big story of the day is about electric vehicles. It's called a new surge in power use is threatening U.S. climate goals. And it goes deeper than just electric vehicles, but it describes real problems. You're going to be shocked to hear this. Real problems with the pitch that you've received over the past few years about how wonderful all of this green technology really is and what it will do for our country and economy and where we're going from here. Why? Well, it's always unexpected, right? Green technologies, they, they make these projections. They tell you how much better everything is going to be. And then uh, you get punched in the face by reality. Reality comes into play and reality says, oh, by the way, all those ridiculous projections you made, they're all nonsense. We're going a totally different direction. We're going in a direction of prosperity and, and new technology that you didn't see coming. What a surprise. They didn't see it coming. They never see it coming. I constantly go back to this one story from the year 1900, but it's a really, um, really beneficial way to look at how difficult it is to project what the next environmental catastrophe is going to be. In 1900, in Manhattan, people were 
out of their mind trying to figure out what you would do with all the horse poop. We've got this city is growing and all the poop is all over the place because there's more and more horses going around and pulling people around. This is going to keep growing. There's going to be horses everywhere. There's going to be poop everywhere. How do we get it off of this island? A sensible question in 1900. But then, you know, the automobile came around and kind of got rid of that problem completely. And that stuff keeps happening. Sometimes it's good news, uh, or I would argue it was good news with the uh, auto- automobile, not only because you get to your, where you want to go faster, but it smells a lot better, at least compared to most Ubers. Sometimes you get in an Uber, actually, you'd probably rather have the horse poop. But Most of the time, it smells better. Um, Here's uh, some of the New York Times, and these are all quotes. Over the past year, electric utilities have nearly doubled their forecasts. In one year, they've doubled their forecasts of how much additional power they will need by 2028 as they confront an unexpected explosion in the number of data centers, an abrupt resurgence in manufacturing driven by new federal laws, and millions of electric vehicles plugged in. Take those three for a second. Take those three examples. This is so fundamental to what we talk about all the time. If you are a conservative, if you are someone who cares, if you're a libertarian who cares about the the way markets actually work and are skeptical of government action, this is such a great example. And it's what are the three Uh, data centers? Well, we have all these new laws trying to incentivize uh, computer uh, technology type stuff here in America. The Chip has, CHIPS Act is part of that. Uh, the resurgence in manufacturing driven by new federal laws, right? Uh, the uh, Inflation Justice Adjustment Act trying to get you to buy American, all these things. Well, all this manufacturing is now being propped up by the government here in the United States, even though it's far too expensive to actually compete. So what happens? Well, you got a lot of new demands on electricity there and millions of electric vehicles. How many times have we talked about this? If you start, if you go from a gas economy with your with your transportation to an electric economy, some of that will be fun. Some of that will be cool. The cars will go nice and fast. Some of them, some of them will be great. But when you're changing that demand on your grid, when you don't have a grid that can actually hold up to it, that's kind of a problem. How many times have conservatives said this? You're incentivizing action you're not prepared for. Well, here we are. Now, uh, expectations are doubling. Their projections were totally wrong. Remember, these are the projections telling you we're going to save all these emissions and save the world. Well, they were all wrong. Yet again, here we are. In an ironic twist, says the New York Times, the swelling appetite for more electricity, driven not only by electric cars, but also by battery and solar factories and other aspects of the clean energy transition... They could also jeopardize the country's plans to fight climate change. Who could have possibly seen this coming except those with eyes? And here we are once again fighting these same battles that we were right on all these all these years. And we're in the same period. Now the New York Times comes along. They're like, oh, my God, the Hunter Biden laptop is real. Well, thanks for joining the party, New York Times in Georgia where dozens of electric vehicle companies and suppliers are setting up shop, the state's largest utility now expects, ready for this, 16 times as much growth in electricity demand this decade as it did two years ago. Not 50 years ago, not 100 years ago, not even 10 years ago. Two years ago, they're like, oh, we need this much. Oh, now we need 16 times as much. Does that sound like the type of people who should be advising you on what vehicle you should be buying or where the economy should be going? Has anyone ever heard of centrally planned economies losing? It used to be American uh, history. We, We knew we won and we knew the Soviet Union lost. Why? They were centrally planning all the time. We weren't. We won. Now we centrally plan and now we lose. That's how this goes. Some utilities say they need additional fossil fuel capacity because cleaner alternatives like wind or solar aren't growing fast enough and can be bogged down by what? Delayed permits and snarled supply chains. Utilities also note, and you'll be shocked to hear this, that data centers and factories need 24-hour-a-day power, something wind and solar can't do alone. Really? I, for one, am totally stunned by this. You're telling me the sun just isn't out 24 hours a day? The wind isn't a reliable 24-hour-a-day power source? That's shocking to me. 
I've always noted when I walk outside, the wind is the exact same speed all the time and is always light, no matter when I walk out of my home. What world are these guys living in? Every person on Earth knew this was coming, except the experts in the New York Times and in our government. But here we are. To meet spiking demand, utilities in states like Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia are proposing to build dozens of power plants over the next 15 years that would burn what? Oh, reliable natural gas. In Kansas, one utility has postponed the retirement of a coal plant to help power a giant electric car battery factory, which I freaking love that little anecdote. This is happening, of course, all throughout the green economy. Some utilities say they'll need additional fossil fuel capacity because cleaner alternatives like wind or solar aren't growing fast enough and can be bogged down by delayed permits and snarled supply chains while a data center can be built in just one year. Think about this. It can be five years or longer to connect renewable energy projects to the grid and to in a decade to build some of the long distance power lines they require. Utilities also note that data centers and factories need that power 24 hours a day, as I mentioned. So think about this. You have a one year window to launch a giant data center, which, of course, money's being dumped into that. But it takes five years to get the clean energy ready to provide the power for that data center and 10 years to get the lines built to go to the actual data center. Does this make sense to anyone else? Hmm. So far, one state, the one state that seems to be able to do this kind of well and keep pace with the explosive demand is where? Texas, where electricity has risen by 29% over the past decade, driven by things like Bitcoin mining, the thing that Elizabeth Warren tells you is going to be the problem, in fact, has been the solution largely in these cases, liquefied natural gas terminals and the electrification of oil fields. Texas's streamlined permitting process allows wind, solar, and battery projects to get built and connected faster than almost anywhere else. So, everywhere else is like, oh, we'll build the green stuff and we'll bog it down with bureaucracy. At least Texas is saying, look, if you want to build the green stuff, fine. But uh, as I hit the Bidenomic strikes back mug, which is a, quite, a, quite a statement at this particular moment. But Texas is actually doing something about it. They're the ones building the capacity. And of course, they're also the one that gets blamed by everybody. Wasn't there a time before you make this transition to electric everything that you think about? I don't know. The freaking power grid and how it can be. It, does it have the capacity to pr- pr- uh, produce that much power? Can you get the power to the places you need it to be? Of course, it doesn't seem like anyone thought about it because they were all ignoring you when you said it over and over again. They didn't want to hear it from you. You're just some guy. You're just some lady. You're just talking out your ass. You don't know what you're talking about. They're experts. Well, guess what? You were right and they were wrong. And for some reason, even though every person on earth knew this was coming, they're not prepared for it. Nobody, apparently except for Texas, actually accounted for the increase in power surge. And and look, Texas isn't like perfect here. We had a massive problem a couple of years ago, but at the very least, they've increased capacity enough to deal with the large surge in general baseline power. That's at least part of the battle. There's all this new demand for power, but it's impossible to build that infrastructure almost everywhere in the country. That's a problem. Now, of course, no one would even be using any of this technology because no one wants it. You know, I, ah, geez, I didn't, I'm going to bring this article into you a little, a little bit later, but there's a whole story uh, about how these cars are being produced. They're going to these lots and they're staying on the lots for, you know, two and three times as long as the gas powered cars. People don't want them. They also don't want solar panels. They also don't want any of that crap. The only reason any of it sells at all is all the government giveaways, the subsidies that go to people who buy them. Well, yeah, you know, you might consider a Tesla if they're going to pay you $7,500 to buy one. Well, okay, maybe that makes sense then. Same thing with solar panels. You're getting tons and tons of cash to put this on the board. I will tell you, um, I was uh, looking at an investment I was considering recently and talking, and they were talking about something with residential real estate. And they, they were look, talking about how eventually these, uh, this real estate package may be purchased by a, a larger big guy that comes in and swoops in and buys it up. And then they said, well, we're buying these houses largely to make sure we are ready in case someone who's bigger wants to come in and buy them up. And we have all these different restrictions and they need to have this many bedrooms and have all these different things. And one of the uh, things that were a requirement, a requirement, no solar panels, none. Why? 
well, you got the maintenance, first of all. But secondly, you have all these crazy contracts with people who are selling solar panels. And so these companies don't even want to be bogged down in it. It's a total mess. How does this happen? How do we get forward from here? People don't even want these things. Now, look, if you have solar panels already on the house, you'd think, okay, this is a wonderful positive. No, it's not even a positive then. Even if you're not paying for it directly, people still don't want this stuff. And what happens? I ask you this. I showed you those charts, these down 90%, these companies. Uh, all these companies having these struggles. And this is with a very friendly administration who wants to do nothing more than give away trillions of your tax dollars to these companies to do these things. What happens if Biden loses? What happens if Biden loses? What happens to these companies if Donald Trump is in charge and is no longer interested in giving away trillions of dollars to these companies? What happens then? These companies are going to die. And what happens to your green future then? Much smarter, of course, is to just build an economy based on a market where people buy the things they want, not manipulating the market to tell them what they need. If you did it that way, you'd notice that a lot of times the market would play out. I mean, I think people would still buy Teslas, frankly, even without the government giveaways, many of which have expired over the years for Tesla in particular, but are still available for other companies. You know, I think people would still buy Teslas because they like those cars. I think people, for example, would continue to use LED lighting because they notice it's better. That's how these things work and stick. The government can come in and spend a bunch of money and sure hire some people and brag about their job gains and then they can brag about the growth of the industry. Of course they can do that. It's easy. When you're giving away money that isn't yours, all of this is easy. But that money dries up eventually. And when it dries up, you've got nothing because people don't actually want these products. They don't want them. They want things that actually work. And until you can come up with a product that can compete in an equal way, uh, on an equal playing field with gas-powered products and fossil fuel-backed uh, uh, products, you're going to wind up with a four-year cataclysmic question on your entire industry. That's no way to run an economy. And, of course, the people who are running our economy ha these days have absolutely no idea that's true. When you're going through your grocery store aisle and you're looking to maybe pick up some meat for the kids, and you're going to cook, cook at home, what do you do? Where do you, where's that meat coming from? Do you know? Well, most of it's imported from God knows where. Uh, and, and a lot of times it'll say product of the USA. Well, what does that mean? It means it was packaged here, but it doesn't mean it was raised here. There is a solution to this, Backyard Butchers. This is a Christian, Texas-based company that is dedicated to delivering the best deals on high-quality American-raised beef. No more mystery meat, just good old-fashioned beef from the heartland of America. Right now, if you go to backyardbutchers.com slash stew, you can use the code stew, and you'll save an extra 20% off your entire order. Plus, when you subscribe, you'll get an additional 10% off, plus free shipping. So, I mean, free shipping makes a big difference when you're talking about this type of stuff. Uh, cut out the frustration from the meat aisle. Support American farmers. Uh, Backyard Butchers is the company that can help you do that. Head over to BackyardButchers.com. BackyardButchers.com slash stew. Uh, order your box now. Get American raised beef in your house today. It's BackyardButchers.com slash stew. I want to bring in Jason Buttrell, head writer and researcher for Glenn Beck. Jason and the Blaze Originals team have a brand new documentary out today. It's called Texas versus the Feds. You can watch it on Blaze TV right this second, though I wouldn't recommend that. I would wait a few minutes at least. Uh, go to therealbordercrisis.com and use the code BORDER. You'll get 30 bucks off your Blaze TV subscription. That's how you can watch the doc. And uh, Jason, thanks for coming on the program. I, yep. I know this was, uh, I mean... It is the biggest issue for voters, right? Like, just take apart the actual issue, which has always been a big issue. Conservatives have been talking about the border forever, but have not always had uh, agreement when it comes to the left on these issues. Increasingly, though, we're seeing some actual cross-partisan sort of stuff here going on because the situation's so bad. Yeah, I don't... It's, it's funny, you always... Well, it's not funny, it's, it's pathetic and sad, but you always see the border come up in an election year or in the few months leading up to an election year. All the time. Yeah. I don't think Donald Trump gets elected president in 2016 if not for the border issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. he, he was a master in making people really care about it. 
Um, it didn't start becoming an issue then. It had always been an issue. But he was very good at showing the people, you know, you know, uh, exactly, I guess, how to be angry at this and why this needs to change. Well, I, I do give the Trump administration credit for a lot of the changes because um, uh, Joe Biden, I think, intentionally broke the border by getting rid of all the things that Donald Trump did on it. You know, remain in Mexico, um, ending catch and release, uh, scaling back parole, all, all these different things that Joe Biden did on one day in February, just boom, just completely destroyed the border. Um, I don't think that any side, and this is kind of like one of the realizations I had towards the end of filming this, I don't think any side has any real intention of seriously fixing it. I don't think they do. And, that, and what's crazy is, and this is what really blackpilled me on it, is I thought that at least Texas would be, you know, different. We have Republicans just like you know like we have in here like we have in Washington DC that you know clearly see a crisis that they want to take advantage of and it's more politically beneficial for them just to you know talk about it and get people angry about it but come on we are this is an issue that we have to deal with every single day we are right on the border oh yeah this affects it. all the communities along the southern border they affect this state i after filming this i had the realization that you know i wish that our leaders here in Texas were more sincere. I wish that they would do more. And mm. that is not what I found at all doing this. Mm. That's, not, that's, a, that's terrifying. And again, you can watch the, uh, the documentary as part of the Blaze TV subscription. Uh, make sure to sign up. Um, let me go back to how this all came together because this was at the period where, it's not, not that long ago, a few, a few weeks ago or a couple months ago, where they're having this big border caravan. This yeah. was the biggest story in the country for a week. Everyone's talking about this. It was, we were told we were going to have these extremists going down to the border. They are going to do all these crazy things. We're going to have another January 6th. All these things were going on around in the media, and you were just decided, hey, why don't we just go with these guys and see what's going on? Yeah, I mean, because I mean, actually, do the job the media should be doing, right? right. Like, if you're going to call somebody a Christian nationalist and dangerous, mm -hmm. maybe you should ask that person before you call them that. Yes, uh, that's. I, I thought that was journalism. Right. You know, maybe you just don't lob labels and names at people without actually investigating. And that was one of the more terrifying things. I mean, that was a crazy time. When you think about it. December, January, and February were watershed moments for for immigration and the border. December, you you know, we had. 300,000 encounters, you know, on on the border. And a lot of that was, you know, coming through Eagle Pass right there. Um, Texas sees the border, uh, or that little park, Shelby Park there in Eagle Pass. First couple weeks of January, something like that. And then that, of course, kicked off a lot. I mean, I was crazy proud to be a Texan at that point. Mm. I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. And a lot of people were having that same, you know, feeling and that group that started the tech take our border back convoy were like let's you know let's let's go in solidarity let's you know support them and they uh, announced that they were going to start in Virginia Beach Virginia and drive all the way across in a big what was kind of branded as a trucker convoy you know kind of like in Canada and Europe um, all the way down to Eagle Pass and that was the first kind of like if you think that you know we're manipulated by the government we're also, you know, when it comes to the border and immigration, we're also manipulated by the media. And uh, the media instantly, just like you said, Christian nationalists, you know, um, you know, dangerous, you know, January 6th, another one. You know, mm -hmm. it was like, those were the top headlines. And I showed up, we showed up uh, with them uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So I guess kind of halfway through their trip. And uh, you show up and the morning of, which we have on the dock tonight, they're going through a morning prayer. And I'm like... I'm not getting those dangerous vibes. Um, but you're getting Christian vibes. I'm getting Christian mm -hmm. vibes, but very different there. Um, then I go up to talk. Oh, so let's take that. I'm getting Christian vibes. Am I getting the nationalist vibes? Right. Talk to some of the same people. Um, they didn't even know what the heck Christian nationalist was. Um, <laughs> when I told them that, yeah, this is part the, the, that you would think that you're against the con Constitution. You don't believe in the Constitution of the United States, you know, and you want a theocracy. Then they're like, we're literally handing out pocket constitutions. Right, right. All of our vehicles have been wrapped <laughs> with a big ass constitution on yeah. the side of it. Yeah. I mean, so they're clearly not against the US constitution. Then I'm like, well, then where does this label come from? And I think that a lot of them would just own it. They're like, okay, fine. I don't know what a Christian nationalist is, but I am a Christian and uh, you know, I do love this country. So fine, call me a Christian nationalist. Mm -hmm. I think we as Christians that have strong political beliefs need to be very, very careful of that because you're kind of walking right into those labels that were being thrown around at that time. And those labels do have meaning. I mean, I, you know, I, 
Because you're right. Like what they're trying to do now is, are you patriotic and are you Christian? Therefore, you're a Christian nationalist. And like it, it's like almost like just like, fine, call me whatever you want. I understand that instinct, but like Christian nationalism has a real history. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not a positive one. They do. There are a lot of people who talk about um, this, you know, not a lot. There are some people who talk about this idea of a theocracy, and there are some people who seem to think that's a good idea. I am not one of them. I don't think that's you know what the country was founded on. They're a minority. Yeah, you no, really very I, small. I looked into this because I started looking into all the people that were involved in this, and uh, none of their views were Christian nationalist views. I did run across some legitimate Christian nationalists, but I guarantee you, probably ninety nine percent of the country has never heard of any of these names. Right. Um, they're not prominent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a small fraction of society that for some reason, the government and the media is trying to make it seem like they're a large majority in society. Right. And that's right. where you need to start being very, very careful with what you kind of just proclaim and say, well, fine, just call me that. Because yeah. in history, the government has always used the use of labels like communist. Just ask Martin yeah. Luther King. Um, I, I think I see this sim, in a similar way. And let me run this theory by you. In a similar way of how the left and the media use racist, and then the left and the media used birther. Right? Mm. There are racists. There are birthers. There are Christian nationalists. They're a very small percentage. And instead of just taking taking that view on and saying, "Look, as we did, like, look, we don't um, racism obviously wrong. We're not white nationalists. We think that's terrible." Um, you know, the birther thing. I never believed in that. Some people did, but I never did. Um, and call those things out here. This is why we don't believe in them and try to disprove that for the small sect of people who do believe it. Instead of doing that, they, it's much more beneficial for them to keep it alive, right? Like Barack Obama wanted the birther thing to exist because it was an easy way to paint all of his opponents as sort of Looney Tunes, right? Like it was an easy thing for him to do. He loved that story every inch of the way. And I think right now, the same thing with Christian nationalism. They don't want Christian nationalism to go away. It's too valuable a foil. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I absolutely agree. And um, that's another reason why we have to be careful with what we you know, are labeling ourselves as. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I was really curious when I first heard that we were going to go do this. Um, because this was one of the first big kind of like events, I guess, from the right post January 6th. Mm-hmm. And the reason being for that is everyone was scared to death on the right to actually go out and get caught up in another January 6th like scandal. Yeah. You have, you know, agitators that are, you know, whether they're fr- from within the government, FBI, whatever, just trying to catch people involved in something or you know, escalate, it, escalate them into doing something, or outside agitators, like actual bad people that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that would kind of get mixed up in it. People were just scared to let their voices be heard. Yep. These people were not when I talked to them. They, they did not care. And, and in fact, many of them show, uh, were telling me that they hoped that this would draw people out, not for violence, but just to let their voices be heard. Like they were hoping that would be kind of like, uh, you know, the torch bearing moment where people would finally come out and say, okay, we're not scared. Um, we're not going to be intimidated mm-hmm. by either the government or really bad actors. We're going to go out there and say, yes, we want a strong border. We do believe in law and order. Um, I, I don't want to give this moment away in the documentary because it's really uh, fascinating. But there's a moment in the documentary where you're, you're on the border and you're trying to access a certain point on the border. And I think, first of all, it's very funny. <laughs> but second of all, it highlights how difficult this is in some ways like locking up the border could be done but the the restrictions that we have whether you know sometimes it's environmental sometimes it's legal sometimes it's private property all these things uh, and it's almost always connected to the central government if with all these issues and these borders and these border these these uh, obstacles in your way it's almost impossible to cover the border at times and it makes it obvious as to they're not doing enough to actually stop this problem. I, I, I don't know if I'm, I don't want to tip my hand too much as to what it is, but like, do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Like, it's almost like it, it makes, it, it, you shine a light on the border in a way that I don't think I'd seen before. Yeah, well, the entire border and as far as security on the border, and, and even the, app, you know, the, the idea of building a wall is pretty much all just bull crap. Um, I think a wall can help in some cases, uh, but a lot of people don't know it's that a, 
ultimate solution. It's part of the solution. It, part of the solution, but a lot of people also don't realize that if you don't fix how asylum works, right. the wall doesn't matter because the actual border is not the wall. Um, that's another thing we'll show in the documentary is there's a, a huge wall down there by Eagle Pass. Um, but it's probably what, like maybe a little less than half a mile away from the actual border. So the border is the middle of the Rio Grande. So anybody that wants to come across the border and claim asylum, the moment they pass the midpoint of the, of the river, right. this is long before you get to the wall. You're still looking at another 10 to 15 minute walk to the wall. Wow. So long before you get to the wall, all you have to do is go, asylum. And if the laws are, are soft, if they are just have this like, catch and release program or parole, all these things that are incentivizing immigrants to come over, the damage is already done. Mm -hmm. They're already here. They're going to be gone within the matter of hours when they disappear into the United States. It's done. But you got to wonder, why did the Texas government, I'll get as close to this as I think I can, why did the, uh, the Texas government seize such a high-profile location like Shelby Park right in the middle of Eagle Pass? Mm. Why did they do that? Why did, are there, did they continue for weeks afterwards, uh, all these red state governors go down, making a big show of support, standing right there in the middle of Shelby Park, with Governor Abbott, including celebrities like Elon Musk. Um, they wanted cameras down there. They wanted this to get pushed out to as many pe places as possible. Um, the way they were showing this, I'm trying to do this without getting in trouble. The way they were showing this, it made it look like the Texas National Guard had completely locked this down. Mm. It was Texas versus the feds. What I found, that's kind of a lie. Mm. I'll put it like that. All right. But we did do some interesting things to circumvent yeah. <laughs> some of that security. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Um, Legally, it was all legal. Sure, sure. Of course it was. Um, it was. Uh, last thing before you leave. Uh, you're the only other person I know who's into this Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, if you don't know uh, Mike Tyson, of course, former champion, Jake Paul, like influencer who boxes sometimes, I yeah. guess is how you describe it. Maybe actor. I don't know what he is. Um, but somehow they're going to be fighting. He's 26 years old. Mike Tyson's 57. And like what I find fascinating about this is I've talked to a few different people about this and they, some people are like, oh, Jake Paul is going to get killed. It's going against Mike Tyson, uh, a, a champion. And then other people are like, wait, Mike Tyson's 57. He's going to get killed by the 26 year old who's in really good shape. Uh, well, how do you see this fight? I, I think it's are like, you into it? I, I'm totally into okay. it. I, I do not like Jake Paul, <laughs> and I hate the, the the fighters he chooses to fight. I think he chooses fights that he knows he can probably win. Right. There was one that was a question, and he lost that fight. Um, but there have also been questions whether these, these are even real. You know, like if, yeah. if it's just big. And, and it is. It's, it's a media circus. I, I, I think fighting Mike Tyson is also a media circus. But he is not your normal 57-year-old. No. He posted a video yesterday. He looks like a monster, <laughs> an absolute monster. And I don't care. Like I, To this day, I'm not going one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan. No. He's going to destroy me. Yes. And he's got a huge pot belly, and he's how old? He's probably like 50? Yeah. Something like that. I ain't fight. I mean, I mean, I'm not playing him one-on-one. -on -one. He'd destroy me. What? Jake Paul, do not fight this man. Yeah. If this is real, if, if influencer boxing is not a setup, I think it gets stopped in the first round. Really? I'll make the prediction. And, and you think Tyson's going to be the one who wins? Hundred bucks. Well, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I got enough bets out there. I, <laughs> and I, I kind of think the same thing. I think. I mean, at I, part times I see the Jake Paul stuff, and he seems to to win, and I'm like, is he actually good, or is this just a scam? I have no idea. I don't watch boxing that much, and I don't know much about Jake Paul. But like again, a 26 year old you'd think would be able to be competitive with a 57 year old. But I've seen Tyson in his prime. It was scary. Tyson at the yeah. end of his actual boxing career, though, was not scary. No. And if he add on another 20 years, 15, 20 years to that, like, I mean, it could be. I don't know. He, he was getting tattoos on his face and biting people's ears off. I think he was still pretty scary. Yeah, he was pretty scary. You're right. <laughs> I mean, I'll remind you, of Good course. Good at boxing? Maybe not, but yeah, still scary. Exactly. I will remind you, of course, we are talking about a convicted rapist that suddenly <laughs> yes. has made it back into our society and no one seems to notice anymore. Totally different story. Jason Buttrell, head writer and researcher. He's not the convicted rapist, by the way, we should point out. Neither is Glenn Beck, but uh, we, the uh, documentary is Blaze Originals. Uh, it is called Texas versus the feds. You can watch it right now with your Blaze TV subscription. Head to therealbordercrisis.com. Use the code BORDER. Get 30 bucks off your subscription right now. Jason, thanks for doing this. Thanks.
When you absolutely positively have to buy or sell a home, you need realestateagentsitrust.com on your site. Why? Well, they're the best agents in your town. They're the best agents in your area. They have the best results in your area. They understand what you're looking for. They know how to do this. They've done it a bunch of times. They're not like part-time agents that are just figuring this out. They've been around for a while and they've gone through an extensive screening process. So you know you're getting the best people around. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Whether you're buying a home or selling a home, Anywhere in the country, uh, it's free service to you, so why not check it out? Realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there now, realestateagentsitrust.com. Great news. Kamala Harris is breaking barriers yet again. This time, she's going to visit an abortion clinic. Yes, the first for a president or a vice president, at least that they've told us, because... <laughs> uh, I, I, you tell me a candidate never made it to an abortion clinic. I don't believe that for a second. But uh, at least not as president an official event. They've never been there. Kamala is the first one to go to an abortion clinic. This is such a fascinating thing. Of course, obviously, this is their entire strategy. Make this about some, um, you know, mythical issue that supposedly is for women's rights when, it, and of course, half of the deaths that occur because of the procedure are eventually going to be women. Uh, but that's a whole totally different thing. But like, I thought back at this, like, what a, what an awful thing to do. What an awful thing to do. I mean, I, p- people mocked poor Rudy Giuliani for standing out there in the heat in front of four seasons total landscaping with hair dye coming down the side of his face. Was that more embarrassing than presenting yourself as a hero to what's going on inside the abortion clinic? You know, I, a lot of times you'll have like, oh, people will be doing a press conference at a school. They'll be there talking to the kids as they write on their desks and they'll go to a factory and they'll be there with a hard hat on and they'll be, oh, look at, look at this guy putting together these cars and blah, blah, blah. You know, you ever wonder, I, I don't think we're going to see, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're going to see uh, Kamala you know, standing there as the abortion goes on inside the room. Do you? And if, if, if so, why not? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't she do that? Is it because she's horrified by the actual process going on inside and doesn't want anyone to know about it? Doesn't want anyone to think about it for any second? I will say, I I may be jumping the gun here. It's very possible she is doing the press conference with the abortion going on right behind her. So I shouldn't put it past her. We will uh, we will see on that. And we also have Olivia Rodrigo. At her concert, she's handing out free morning after pills in Missouri, a state where abortions are illegal. Now, I don't know if the morning after pill is illegal in Missouri. Um, probably, I assume not. Maybe, but I don't, again, they, because she's famous, they may not have shut her down even if she was doing that. We've come a long way with the pop celebrities, right? Like, remember like the Jonas Brothers were handing out like promise rings? I remember Justin Bieber's actually a virgin. And <laughs> that was like a big topic for a while. Now it's like, ah! We're just going to have as much sex as you want, just abort the kid in the, in the lobby. I mean, I, I think, I guess that's what we're doing now. So congratulations to the left. They've you know, really done a great job bringing the culture of life to our country. What a wonderful thing you're standing for here. You know, if it wasn't for you, we'd have so many babies that would be alive. And what a terrible world that would be. So congratulations to Olivia Rodrigo and Kamala Harris. About six uh, months ago, I came into the radio show and Glenn's raving about this movie he saw. And, you know, I, I'm like I've never seen him talk about a movie before. And he's like, it's not even the final cut yet. It's incredible. You have to see it. Well, that movie has finally arrived. It's in theaters now. It's called Cabrini. Audience and critics uh, agree. Cabrini is a must-see. 98% audience score, 91% crit- critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. It's based on the true story of a woman's fight for the equality, health, and happiness of immigrant orphans. I don't know how you're going to vilify uh, Cabrini. I, I, the left is going to probably dry at some point. I don't even know. But again, it's not, it's not about left and right here. This is a, but just a great story and a great movie from Alejandro Monteverde. Uh, this is, of course, an award-winning director of The Sound of Freedom. This comes a powerful epic of Francesca Cabrini, an Italian immigrant who arrives in New York City in 1889 and uh, is greeted by disease, crime, and impoverished children, which sounds a little bit too much like New York in 2024 as well, but that's a totally different story. Cabrini sets off on a daring mission to convince the hostile mayor to secure housing and health care for society's most vulnerable. Broken English, poor health, lots of hurdles. Cabrini uses her entrepreneurial mind to build an empire of hope unlike anything we have ever seen before. 
Left and right agree Cabrini is a film all Americans can celebrate and love. It's a New York story, but more importantly, it's an American story. It's in theaters now. Just purchase your tickets in advance online. Go to angel.com slash stew, angel.com slash stew. The movie is Cabrini. You can see it in theaters everywhere. It's angel.com slash stew. I don't want to spend your money most of the time. I mean, if you give it to me, I will happily spend it. But I'm talking more about government money. I don't want the government to do like 90% of the stuff that they do. Okay? That's what I want as a society. But there is one thing I want the government probably to be involved in, which is really cool, super duper weapons. They're awesome. And also, we need them for our defense. I think spending, sometimes irrationally, on weapons and future weapon design is something the government should be, if we're going to do anything, they should do that. Well, now we have something, this is from the British government, embarrassingly, but um, the British government is beating us on this, but air defense for $13 a shot? How lasers could revolutionize the way militaries counter enemy missiles and drones. Lasers. Um, I'm uh, really ex- interested and excited about this. I mean, if you watch the, I can't remember which documentary it was, it was one where the, is it uh, White House down? One, I don't know, it was one of those. And all the, the swarm of drones come down. And you look at that and you're like, how could we defeat that? It's so cheap. We're seeing it with the Houthis now uh, where it's like really difficult to do. And we're shooting down $2,000 drones with $500,000 missiles. And even that's really hard to do, but we're able to pretty much do it. $13 a shot. If this is reality, this is going to be an incredible thing, and we should be developing stuff like this all the time. Uh, also, uh, one more quick thing. Bernie Sanders has unveil- unveiled a 32-hour work week bill. This would basically mean instead of getting overtime at 40 hours, you get it at 32. You get uh, 1.5 times uh, hours f- for anything longer than eight hours. And you know, it's a typical, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders union type thing where they want to make everybody, everything's free. Someone, who was it? Stephanie Slade, I think, pointed this out. You know, progressive economics means wanting to only have $10 a day health care. Only costs the parents $10. But then you also have to pay $20 an hour to all the employees who live there. How does that work? No one knows. And this Bernie Sanders thing is nonsense. Of course, it shouldn't pass. I will say the 32-hour work week or something like it is coming. This is not this is not this is happening. It's going to happen um, because of market forces, the AI stuff, how it's taking jobs. I think the way this likely looks is not necessarily all the jobs go away, but that the jobs wind up being far fewer hours than they were. It's going to start going down towards 32. We saw this pitch for $15 minimum wage. Everybody laughed at it, including me when it started. And then here we are. Seems like basically everyone's doing that now. The 32 hour work week is going to come. We better get used to it. We better figure out what we're doing with our lives because the world is changing quickly. Okay, so here's what happened. I got to get through these quickly because they're amazing. And then I have a question for you at the end. Um, Well, the rats are all high, says the... (laughs) <laughs> the New, or- New Orleans Police Department had a bunch of rats and they went into the evidence room and they ate all the drugs. So the rats are high. Uh, I'll give you a second story. A chemical cat at large in a Japanese city, officials warned. Chemical cat fell into a vat of chemicals, now is covered in toxic chemicals. So my question for you is, who wins in a fight? Is it the chemical cat? or the fleet of drug-infested rats. Now, of course, if they were cocaine rats, I would pick the rats. However, they've been eating the marijuana. So they're stoned rats. They might be very hungry, but I think defeatable because they're gonna be just far too dazed and confused.